Hi, my name is Randy Schaup. Uh, welcome to Go to Chicago 2020 uh, Sheltering in Place Edition, coming at you from the California coast. Uh, I want to talk to you today about moving fast at scale. Uh, so a little bit about my background so you know where I'm coming from with some of these ideas. Um, most recently I've been VP of Engineering at WeWork and at Stitch Fix. Uh, and then earlier in my career I spent a bunch of time in engineering leadership positions at Google and eBay. And the idea of this presentation is to talk about how these high performing organizations have continued to be able to uh, be innovative, move quickly, even as they've grown larger and larger uh, at scale. So I want to talk about three particular areas today. I want to talk about the high performance culture. I want to talk about building a large organization out of small autonomous teams. And finally, I want to talk about the importance of focus and prioritization. Uh, so let's start with high performance culture. Um, one of the great uh, books of the last couple of years has, was the uh, Accelerate book, uh, Nicole Forsgren and her collaborators. Um, if you have not yet read this book, then I suggest that you pause this video, uh, go off, buy the book, read it, and then come back. It's really an excellent uh, summary and an excellent um, uh, delving into the science behind how high-performing technology organizations work. In, uh, what I want to highlight here, though, is, the, uh, is uh, some of the things they say about uh, organizational culture. And so uh, following the model of Ron Westrom, um, they talk about three different kinds of organizations. The kind you want to be in is what's called the generative organization. And we're going to be talking most about that in this high performance culture section now. Uh, and that kind of the generative organization is characterized by trust and by sharing. It's a situation where you don't shoot the messenger, you celebrate uh, that person. Uh, novelty is, uh, is celebrated as opposed to um, uh, despised. Uh, it's the kind of place that um, uh, can produce good work uh, and new innovative work. A bureaucratic organization is one that's characterized by rules and processes. So if you've ever worked in a place where we stick by the standards, uh, we do the same thing today as we've always done it, and the why is because we've always done it that way. Uh, that's a bureaucratic organization. Uh, and then the place you really don't want to be is what's called a pathological organization, where people are motivated by fear and by threat. So people are doing their jobs because they're afraid to be fired or afraid to be humiliated, um, rather than because they genuinely want to uh, want to do a good job. So. Even farther back behind uh, some of Ron Westrom's ideas um, is this idea of Theory X and Theory Y. And I'll explain what those are in a moment. It comes uh, 60 years ago now from Dr. Douglas McGregor, who wrote this book called The Human Side of Enterprise. And he was trying to explore leadership's beliefs about what motivates employees. So what do leaders believe about why uh, people do their jobs and why they're motivated and so on? So uh, McGregor differentiated between these ideas Theory X and Theory Y. Uh, and candidly, I'm not super wild about the names, but those are the names we have. So we're going we're gonna to use them. Uh, in th the Theory X leader believes that people are inherently lazy. They try to avoid responsibility. And therefore, they require extrinsic motivation, meaning they require uh, micromanagement. They, they require uh, being told what to do, or otherwise they're not going to do anything. Theory Y uh, leaders and Theory Y organizations, by contrast, uh, believe that people are intrinsically motivated rather than extrinsically motivated. They genuinely uh, seek ownership. They genuinely want to perform well. Uh, and it's these kinds of leaders and these kinds of organizations that tend to produce the best outcomes. So uh, this is a wonderful diagram, uh, not mine, but it uh, diagrammatically uh, shows some of these same ideas. So in the Theory X side, management is on the top, sort of pushing down on the employees. Yuck. Uh, so uh, very tight control. It produces a depressed, very limited, very disempowered culture. Uh, where Theory Y, on the other hand, management is on the bottom, being supportive of the employees, so sort of servant leadership ideas, empowering them, giving them responsibility, encouraging them to take on autonomy and uh, more achievement. Um, and again, these, it's these Theory Y organizations that tend to uh, produce much better outcomes. Um, the other important notion here is what's called psychological safety. 
So a couple of years ago, Google being Google, uh, studied themselves. So, you know, Google collects a lot of uh, a lot of data on the world, maybe on all of us, uh, but they also collect a lot of data on themselves. And they were trying to answer the question, what differentiates the really high performing teams from the less well performing teams? And so you can imagine they might have gone in with some hypotheses that, you know, the best performing teams are the ones that uh, had the most number of PhDs, the people that um, the teams that had the most uh, tenure at Google Google or the most tenure in the industry. And it turns out that none of those things uh, were predictive at all, but instead these five things, the most important of which was what's called psychological safety. What do we mean? We mean that the, is, the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. In other words, everybody in the team is able to show up and employ their whole self without the fear of negative consequences. And when I say our whole self, what I mean is all aspects of us as, our, as people. So our gender identity, our sexual orientation, our political beliefs, uh, all those things we can bring and share uh, without fear of uh, being humiliated or being made to feel, feel bad. And the idea here is not that we all need to be the same. It's not that the team is all the same. In fact, it's even better if the team is diverse. But the key aspect for those high performing teams was that everybody respected one another and it was safe psychologically for teams to people to show up uh, as they are. Uh, and this was more important than any other factor in determining the success of teams at Google. And the insight here is that if we feel safe and we don't have you know, 25% of our brain worrying about whether we're gonna be made to feel bad, we can bring our whole selves to work. The whole team can be way more innovative. Everybody's brains are fully engaged. Everybody's bringing 100% all their ideas, all their crazy uh, notions. Uh, and that is what ends up uh, producing much better value and much, uh, much more innovative work. The last thing I want to talk about here in terms of high performing organizations is cross functional collaboration. Uh, I've now been in the industry for 30 years uh, and the best decisions that I've seen made are decisions that aren't made by necessarily one person but are made through partnership between people that have different perspectives on the problem. Um, and what I have found over and over again is that given common context, well-meaning people genu genu genuinely and generally tend to agree on uh, what the goals and priorities should be, what things we should do to meet those goals and priorities, etc. But the key three words there is given common context. So more often than not, when I found well-meaning people disagreeing, it's not because they fundamentally can't get along with each other or if they have fundamentally different ideas, it's that they lack common context. Is maybe uh, some of us have information or context uh, that other people don't have. And so by sharing those, uh, sharing that context, sharing that information collaboratively, everybody's on the same page. And what I found is most of the time we end up agreeing, um, uh, having a good consensus on how to move forward. But that doesn't, that doesn't always work. Um, sometimes we do genuinely, genuinely have a dif uh, disagreement, a difference of opinion. Um, and here is where we employ this idea of disagree and commit. So this comes out of Intel management culture um, about in the 1970s. Um, and the idea is that we make our, in a psychologically safe environment, we make our best uh, arguments about, okay, I think we should do, you know, approach A and other people make uh, 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 say that we should do approach B. We are transparent. We are respectful of each other. We make our best cases. Uh, if, we, if the team decides to do thing B and I was uh, an advocate of thing A, that's the commit part. Um, even though I disagreed, I had my say. Uh, team went with uh, B, uh, great. So I'm not gonna undermine it. I'm not gonna complain about it. I'm going to uh, fully commit to making the team successful with, uh, with uh, approach B. Great. So that was high performance culture. Now let's talk about autonomous teams. So traditional organizations, when I joined the industry 30 years ago, were organized like this. So there would be some set of idea people, maybe we would call them the business or product management or analysts. They would come up with a bunch of ideas, usually expressed in a thousand page spec. They would throw that over the wall to well-paid typists like I used to be. Uh, so the developers, we would type furiously into our editors. We would then in our turn, uh, throw our code over the wall to quality people to see if uh, what we typed uh, made any sense. Um, and then ultimately, if it passed the quality bar, we would end up uh, shipping it on CDs or uh, somewhere to people and who would operate it in the real world. 
Well, this is not how high-performing organizations uh, behave anymore. Instead, what we've learned is it's much better to co-locate the ideas, the development, the quality, and the operations of a particular area of our business within the context of one team. Uh, and then we build our organization out of a bunch of those individual autonomous teams, each of which is uh, has all the different uh, skill sets and all the different capabilities to get their job done individually. And those individual teams are uh, relatively small. So uh, the term of art comes uh, from Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, that we should be uh, making what are called two pizza teams. Uh, the idea is that a team should be no larger than can be fed by two large pizzas. So maybe depending on the amount of pizza you eat, it could be four people, six people, something like that. Um, but, uh, but we want to keep our team small uh, because we want the intra-team, within the team, uh, collaboration and communication to be very rapid. Uh, and we want to have that team uh, boundary be nice and small so we can uh, focus on getting one thing done and done very well. The other really important aspect of uh, organizational design in this idea is aligning those two pizza teams directly towards some particular business problem or some particular element of customer value. And we should express that business problem with clear goals and clear metrics that actually matter to our customers. Um, and then as a consequence, that team that is responsible for that particular uh, set of uh, goals and metrics aligned around a particular business problem um, does that, achieves that with this particular well-defined area of technical responsibility. So typically a team would be responsible for a single application or service or maybe a set of related applications or services together. And ideally, if leadership uh, has done their job, uh, then I would claim that a healthy organization has the, the, the large majority of project work being done within one of those team boundaries. So as a leader myself, this is a sort of metric that I use uh, for myself. And the number isn't super important. I sort of made it up. Um, but, uh, you know, a large percentage of the, a project work should be within those team boundaries because that's where you get the autonomy, that's where you get the intra-team ability to move fast and uh, produce a lot of value. Um, obviously, if it were something like 20% of the project work or 50% of the project work is actively relying on active collaboration with other teams, I probably haven't done my job in drawing those team boundaries very well. Maybe we should redraw them in a different way to make uh, people teams more able to be autonomous and independent. And obviously there's no way for, by contrast, there's really no way for 100% of project work to be within the context of a team because almost by definition, those really large cross-functional sort of corporate or organizational level priorities are almost by definition going to cross a bunch of individual teams. So if every team was doing 100% of their work all independently, it's kind of like we don't work for the same company. Um, so again, 80% is sort of that middle ground, 80-20 rule of trying to get uh, the project uh uh, project work scoped within the the boundary of a team. All right, so now we've talked about high performance culture and autonomous teams. Now let's talk about focus and prioritization. Uh, so traditional organizations tend to do their development in this way. So let's imagine we have this big long set of priorities that we want to achieve. Uh, we have five people to work on them. So we'll have you know the first person work on priority one, feature one, second person work on feature two, third person work on feature three, etc. Um, this seems like a very obvious, very you know simple way to do it, um, but I think we can do better. Um, and if you take away nothing from this presentation other than these four words, uh, that would be great. Uh, fewer things, more done. What do I mean by that? So uh, because we have a prioritized list of features, um, maybe instead of having treating feature one and feature five in, this, in the same way, maybe we should put several people on feature one at the same time, try to get that done in, let's say, half the time, several people on the second priority thing, get that done in half the time, and then our fifth person can work on feature three. There's a little asterisk here that says, you know, not all features can be worked on by multiple people at the same time. But typically, in my experience, I've found that multiple people can be productive uh, working on the same feature. And then once once they're done, those two with those two things in half the time, those uh, those sets of people can, you know, then uh, shift to working on feature four and feature five. So already we have produced the highest quality or highest uh, priority features first, and we've produced them in half the time. So that's a win. Uh, but I think we can even do better. 
what if we thought a little bit up front and broke that big sort of monolithic feature one down into a bit uh, some subcomponents. So maybe we would release, you know, segments A, B, C, and D of that feature and try to learn along the way. Um, so this iterative development, this incremental development, allows us to release working software to, cust to customers even earlier, get, the, get their feedback, see how things work in production, and then we can use that learning to help uh, direct us at, you know, when we do you know, step B or step C or step D. Um, I've often, often also found that when we, even though we might have thought we needed to go all the way to step D, if we've released to customers, uh, maybe their feedback says, you know, we're done at, feet, at step B or we're done at step C, or we actually need E and F to get uh, the full value of this feature. But the only way we're going to actually learn that is by releasing A and B and C incrementally along the way. Um, this also, uh, this iterative approach also makes us resilient to this. I'm sure all of us have experienced working hard on something for a long period of time. You get really close to being done, and then there's a change in priorities, uh, and we have to drop that thing, or at least pause it and put work on something else. That is incredibly frustrating. It's also uh, wasteful, <laughs> uh, because all of the effort, you know, if we haven't released our software to customers, we've produced exactly zero value. So regardless of the amount of effort we put into it, regardless of the amount of thought and care we put into it, if it doesn't go to customers, it doesn't have any value at all. And so we would like, we would like that incremental uh, approach does allow us to release working software to, to customers incrementally and, may, and abandon it or pause it along the way if we need to. So let's see what we've done with this fewer things more done idea. We've delivered the highest priority features first. We've delivered the full value of those features earlier than we would otherwise. And, and just as with money, features are worth more today than they were uh, would be if we would deliver them a month or two months or three months from now. Uh, we've delivered incremental customer value along the way instead of queuing everything up and waiting till the end. And we've also delivered that value despite potential changes in priorities. Because when we release those incremental uh, units of work with working software, we have uh, even if we end up pausing or abandoning the feature, uh, that stuff that we've produced is, is still there uh, providing value. Great. Uh, so we've talked about uh, high performance culture. We've talked about autonomous teams. We've talked about focus and prioritization. And back to the Accelerate book, um, you know, these things are good in and of themselves. These, are, these all make the world a better place by doing these practices. But the other super important thing that comes out of the science behind this book is that the companies that do these practices end up producing better business results. They are two and a half times more likely to exceed their goals in terms of profitability, market share, productivity. So this stuff, these practices really matter in terms of end results to customers and in terms of business results as well. So thank you very much for your kind attention.